Is this a dream? No, it's not a dream. I'm an angel. Why would God send me an angel? Because God knows that everyone needs a little coaching now and then. I'm loving angels. I saw an angel. All angels say. From him. Please send me an angel. The smile on her face. Be in it to get that little help me, angel. Being touched by an angel, girl. Girl. Hi, and welcome to the Super Angel Podcast, the go-to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends, and join our community at eu.bc. Today, we're happy to welcome Keith, head of International for Played, an open finance platform and data network that powers over 3,000 digital financial apps and more than 12,000 financial institutions across the US, Canada, UK, and Europe. As well as this, Keith leads the strategy and operations for Plaid's international products. If you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. Keith, welcome to the Super Angel Podcast. We are so excited to have you with us. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me, Andreas and Anthony. Uh, thanks for being uh, Keith, and uh, you know, actually, we've co-invested in, the, in a bunch of deals together with Keith. So I'm so excited to have him here, and you know, I do think he's one of the strongest commercial product operators I know, and bring quite a refreshing U.S. experience to the European ecosystem. So yeah, again, thank you, thank you for joining us. Of course, it's great to be here. Would love to start, like you know, hearing a bit, you know, for the listeners, right, your backstory. What got you into operating? What got you into Plaid and then angel investing or, or, you know, the technology ecosystem as a whole? Yeah, I'll go way back for this. And so stop me if I go too far back. But I've really always loved early stage tech since I was in high school. So I went to a basically a boarding school for nerds in the U.S. It was called the School of Science and Math. Our mascot was the unicorn. But I was surrounded by this environment where everyone was like, what's the latest thing that's being built? The latest thing coming out? We always got the popular science magazine. And, and so I really fell in love with tech from that point on. And that's what led me to move to Silicon Valley after university and start my career there. It was really at Google, though, where I started to get into fintech and infrastructure. So I worked on expanding and building out what became their fintech products. So Google Pay API Suite and the Google Wallet app and really started to see under the covers, if you want to build a great consumer experience, the infrastructure that you have to build is very intense and there's a lot of complications around it. And so I started falling in love with solving those problems. And ultimately, that's what led me to Plaid. If people aren't familiar, it's an open banking platform. So it's an infrastructure layer that supports lots of other fintech applications. And I joined to help them expand their offering to Europe for the first time. And so while it wasn't a founder experience, it was almost a mini founder experience because I had to set up a new entity, payroll, operations, compliance, build out the product, then scale the go-to-market team. And now it's a multi-million ARR business and, and off and running. And so I went through that journey. And over that journey, I started to have other people who were doing international expansion or building fintech products start to ask me for advice. How did you handle this? What did you think about scaling your organization in this way? And that's how I really fell into angel investing is really through supporting people who are going through a similar experience that I've been through. And so I almost think of angel investing as as evolution in that sense. You're taking your learnings and trying to help another founder be more successful by supporting them with what you know and the problems and successes that you've seen along the way. So that's sort of a little bit of my journey, if that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. And, you know, I do find that like uh, angel investing is a way of actually ensuring you have a continuous relationship with those people in some respects, right? And in and, and a way that's aligned. But now tell me a bit more about any favorite deals, you know? I mean, 
first of all, how many have you been doing? You know, tell us a bit more about your angel investments, but also any favorites you want to share with the listeners would be great. Yeah, absolutely. I started out angel investing through syndicates and platforms like AngelList, and then moved into doing direct deals and, and supporting founders that I knew directly. I think a few of my favorite deals, and I've probably now at this point done somewhere around 40 angel investments over the past basically three years. So relatively active. Probably my favorite deal is Ramp Network, which is a crypto on ramp. And again, you're very familiar with them as well. But I've just loved Simon and the team that he's been building. The grit that they bring and what they've built as a business is incredible. And so just seeing the speed at which they execute and also the, I, I say, the chip on their shoulders is something I've now started to look for in other founders. I really want to see that grit when I talk to someone early stage because you're going to go through so many ups and downs if you're founding a company that I think that's the number one quality that I look for. And so Ramp Network is probably my favorite deal I've ever done. And then another deal I'll mention is supporting people that I've seen sort of go through working with me and then leave and build their own company. And so I also invested in Stitch, which is XPlat alums founding an authentication startup in the US. And I think it's so exciting to watch people that you've known and seen grow go on to become their own fantastic founders. So those two deals stick out for me as ones that are really have a sort of special place for me. Yeah, absolutely. And when you go back, right, and look through the experience of the 40 investments you've done to date, what would you say angel investing has given you or something you wouldn't have expected even that it might have given you, whether professionally or personally? Yeah, I think a few things there. One is it's helped me crystallize my own experience and learnings. Like I, th I think I almost think of the way you would think about it if you're writing your own business book or something. If you actually have to share your ideas and your experience with someone else, it makes you think through, why did I make these decisions? Why did I, I structure things this way? And it makes you reevaluate and have a more clarity about your own experience. And then the second thing I would say there is actually building an amazing network and, and sort of friendship group out of this angel investing process. For me, I really love to be on WhatsApp level communication, texting back and forth with the founders I invest in, introducing the people I think they should know. And so oftentimes, whenever they come through London or if they're in London, I meet up with them and you really start to actually develop a great relationship beyond just an investor or angel relationship. And so I think it's a great way to build a fintech community and to be embed yourself in that fintech community. I think that's probably one of the things I've enjoyed the most. I'd love to just double click on that because now you said that fintech community and, and you're obviously building yourself in the fintech world as well. Do you stick to that sector? Is that how you think about it or what is the strategy? Yeah, because I, I like to think of it as well from the founder's perspective, right? Like you're not just investing in a founder. A founder is investing in you. They're giving you a piece of what they're building in exchange for something. So what are you bringing to the table there? And so I like to invest in companies where I know I can add value. And for me, that's very clearly fintech, crypto, B2B companies, and in particular, API-based businesses where you have to think through how do you structure your go-to-market motion? How do you think about pricing? How do you think about verticalizing your customers, things that I've gone through myself. And so I do tend to do 95% of my investments in the crypto and fintech space, just simply because I feel like that's where the exchange of value is best because I can bring a lot to the table for founders. There. The good news is, and maybe that's self-serving because many people will know I'm a bit of a fintech nerd, but I say fintech is everything. So in some respects, it's quite a horizontal and it touches in so many industries. So it's quite a, quite a broad thesis in itself, I would assume. So that's great. Absolutely. I'm, I'm also a believer that every company will become a fintech company at some point. Every tech company will become a fintech company at some point. So it does offer a lot of a broad platform to invest there. <laughs> but then uh, you're giving me the stage here to invite you up and dance all over crypto because, you know, right now we're, <laughs> we're recording this at the time where, where I think everyone is thinking, what the hell is going on? Could we just dive deep there for one second and let you start, Keith? What, how do you talk to your founders right now through the uh, turmoil going on in the market? I think, I mean, it's definitely the depths of crypto winter right now, right? But I think if you're building something of value, especially something that's infrastructure, it's going to go through multiple market cycles. And so I always tell people that actually down markets are the best time to build because you're less distracted. There's less well-funded competitors popping up around you. This is the time to focus on you and your team. And I also think it provides healthy prioritization and discipline. You have to make hard trade-offs that sometimes in a boom market, you might not have had to make. 
And that actually, I think, is a very healthy cycle for any startup to go through. Crypto just happens to seem to go through that every 18 months, but that's also because it's early as an ecosystem. And so it's going through this you know, hype and, and drop cycle. I think the other thing here, though, is it's really important, and I also think about this in the companies in crypto that I invest in, that I'm not investing in something that's built on speculation or hype. Like, what is the actual real value here? And so a lot of what I focus on investing on is people that are building bridges between traditional financial infrastructure and the web, like, and which I think is really where crypto stands out and builds amazing value. And also that you're helping build something that's actually going to add things to people's lives. And so I do think there are companies in crypto that are doing that and that will continue to do that. I'm still a long-term believer in the space, even though obviously right now with the recent FTX news, it's definitely a tough time. I think also good founders are just keeping their heads down and staying focused on the long-term goal. I will come back to this subject because I think it's not necessarily crypto, but fintech and, and how you as a specialist in that sector acts as an angel. But maybe just before we dive really deep, let's get an overview of your investment strategy and thesis and so on. Kind of share with us how you think about your portfolio allocation and you know that kind of thing. I guess, first of all, the way I think about it is what percentage of sort of how I think about my entire net worth am I comfortable putting into angel investing? Because I also like to think of angel investing as it's, there's a very low likelihood of really positive outcomes. You're doing it, you need to be doing it as a way to build an ecosystem, to provide value to other founders, to build a network beyond just the investing side of it. And so, you know, obviously you're not putting 50% of your net worth into angel investing. I think that's a bad decision for anyone. But then I also am thinking about from that perspective, I'm always more focused on the founder allocation. Which of these founders that I speak to, am I going to be willing to spend hours of my time with and why? And that's where I invest accordingly. So I almost think of it in that way. Like if you have limited hours in a day, how would you structure your day? Because I think a lot of angel investing, the value that founder is going to get out of you is having access to you and your knowledge and what you bring to the table. And so I allocate my portfolio in that sense, almost like time-based, who would I want to dedicate the most time to and invest accordingly in that way? And, and maybe given that, you know, I wouldn't ask you for your net worth and ask you how much money are you putting, but I will ask you for your time, <laughs> time worth <laughs> and how much time are you putting, dedicating to angel, angel investing? Yeah, I would say I probably speak to these days, two to three founders a week. And I'm probably doing something like 10 investments a year. And so sometimes these are founders that just are reaching out for very different reasons, or they just want to talk about Plaid or, or something else. But that's probably the number of investments that I'm doing. But I speak to founders all the time. I actually really like that uh, notion of like thinking about uh, the quantity of deals that you're making versus the amount of time you have to dedicate to them. As a funny tidbit, like I remember there was, and I'm not going to name any names, but like it's a founder that actually had a very active investment strategy who had optimized for, let's say, you know, volumes for capturing potentially the best outcomes. And he, he told me that he suddenly realized that literally his whole weekends are wiped out on clearing out WhatsApp messages from his 150 plus investments, right? So it's definitely something for, for the listeners and other angels to take into consideration. And Keith, do touch more on that because I think that it is an interesting concept of, you know, of managing time. And, you know, that is in the end, the most precious resource that all of us have. So do dive a bit into how you, you think about that. And also, how do you ensure that you, you attribute your time to where you, you really, you know, see it being valuable and that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the, the stage of company, the space they're in and, and where I feel like my experience is going to line up with their needs. Then the other thing, one of the questions I always ask founders I talk to is, what are you hoping to get out of this? How do you want to work with me? And there are some founders who say, look, I know I'm going to have these three problems. I'm going to write out a memo of how I'm thinking about it. And I'm going to send you this doc. And if you could just you know, spend the Sunday afternoon putting in your thoughts and comments here, that would be great. There are other founders who say, look, let's just exchange WhatsApps and they'll shoot me a text on the fly whenever they have a question one off that takes five minutes here or there. So you really have to talk with founders and say, look, how do you want to work with me? And there are some who say, I'll contact you when I need you and I never hear from them again. So there, there is this range of how much a founder wants to use you or doesn't want to use you. I just make sure that I'm very upfront about that and we share this, this relationship and understanding because I do think of it like a friendship. 
And I think of it as I'm going to be willing to invest time here. If I'm writing you a check, it's because I'm, I'm willing to spend at least a couple of hours a month talking to you and helping you work through problems. And I think the bigger the opportunity size I see, the more time I'm going to be willing to spend with you, the bigger check I'm going to be willing to write as well. When you then decide to invest, in, do you then typically also do you lead the round slash lead an angel syndicate or do you typically co-invest with multiple others? And is that how do you think about SPVs? Are you happy to join into those or, or, or would you rather go direct? I never want to lead the round because I want to be a supporting force, not the driving force in a company is the way I think about it. And typically I do invest with other angels. I have gone through SPVs just because sometimes from a founder's perspective, that is the easiest way to manage the investment itself and the paperwork. And I'm happy to do that from a syndicate. But I also think founders get the most value out of me when they know me one-on-one. And I do find that I have more of that one-on-one relationship if I'm investing directly or co-investing alongside one other angel versus going through a syndicate or SPV where there's many angels gathering together into one investment. So my preference is to invest solo or alongside just a couple of angels directly versus a broader syndicate, because I think that's where founders know you one-on-one and have more of an impetus to reach out to you for questions they have. And how about, how do you source deals? Because we're going to have many listeners that primarily rely on, let's say, either their personal network or they rely on an angel club they're part of, or, you know, how do you think about that? And also if you could add some words to the different routes or channels of deal flow? Yeah, it's interesting because it's changed over time. I think a big part of my role over the past four years has been building Plaid's presence in Europe. And that has led to me being very visible. I'm always at conferences, I'm doing speaking, I'm doing podcasts. And so I actually tend to have a lot of deal flow of founders reaching out to me just because they've been trying to figure out some problem and they've gone to a conference to hear a talk that I've done, or they've looked up some podcast they had talking about FinTech. And so actually a lot of it comes inbound from just having this presence that I've built in the ecosystem itself. And then the other way is actually from events in London. Again, this sort of is how I started out building my FinTech ecosystem and relationships with the ecosystem here in London. I would go to hackathons. I would go to FinTech drink events. I'm always present. And I have to meet people one-on-one there who are thinking about starting a company. And then a year, six months down the road, when they are ready for that, they reach out and say, hey, I'm thinking about taking the step. How do you approach it? Or I'm launching a new market and taking on a new role. Can you talk me through how you thought about launching markets at Plaid? Things like that. So for me, it's always been sort of building that network and ecosystem and being open for people to find you wherever they are. I would say probably 30 to 40% of my deals are cold inbounds coming off of LinkedIn. Another 30, 40% are referrals from other friends in the ecosystem. We say, you should talk to Keith for this particular problem. Um, And then 20% of them are people that I reach out to or that I see are building something. And I say, hey, let's talk. It's interesting. Anthony, do you want to attach any comments to that? Well, my take is very simple is I'm glad to be hanging out with people like Keith so I can have people like Keith (laughs) being sourcing (laughs) deals for us, right? No, no, not too much to add to that. I will say that the earlier stage you go, the more unscalable it is to source and the closer you are to operator networks, to founder networks, the closer you have a visible superpower, the, the better it is to be either a magnet or to be in the flow of the very interesting people, right? And so you can be systematic and say, you know, I source X amount from VCs and Y amount from founders. Uh, but in the end of the day, I think it's, it's a lot about the personal brand as well and kind of magnifying that. And that's, I think, a way you can scale that beyond. You know, for us, it is like many other funds. I think what really works with Cocoa is we are an angel fund. We don't step on anyone's toes. So on top of what we usually, the usually funds get, we also have VCs actively referring us very good deals rather than, you know, their third, fourth, fifth, you know, at best when you're competing. And also our positioning versus other funds is a lot about helping the founders before they're ready to pitch to the XPC even, right? And so we want to be Keith's recommendation to his ex-colleague before he goes out to talk to the tier one VCs he wants to pitch to, right? Exactly. Keith, I have two questions that I want to ask you before we get to your core learnings from your time as an angel investor. And the first question is, 
you mentioned that it, I think you used the phrasing that when founders come through London, so that means okay, they're not always in London. So how do you think about doing deals internationally? Again, I, I always go back to can I relate my knowledge to the experience this founder is going to be going through? So I'm happy to do international deals as long as I understand the product or market they're going after. Or if it's within the fintech and crypto space, and I feel like you know, especially B two B infrastructure, where I know that my understanding and knowledge is going to translate into value for them, even if it's in a different geographic location. And when I say come through London, actually, a lot of founders, especially in post COVID area, are very mobile or digital nomads, or they actually you know spend most of their time in a different country in Europe. But everyone has to come to London because it's such yeah. a hub for fintech. And so I think if you're a founder in fintech, you are in London at least a couple of times a year for one reason or another. And that's where I always make sure that I make myself available for founders when they're, when they're in this ecosystem. But I'm happy to do international investments. And I think, again, a lot of where I add value is having led international expansion now at multiple companies. I can really bring a lot to the table for international founders that are thinking about how do I come to the UK or I've started my company in Europe. How do I bring it to the U.S.? That's actually a place where my experience is really relevant for founders. And now you are on a call with a VC and a guy who does LP syndicates into VCs. So I, of course, <laughs> have to ask you the question. How do you think about collaborating with VCs? How do you use them in your own you know, network and, and angel investing? And also, if you've invested into funds, how do you use funds as a sparring partner there? Yeah, absolutely. I think VCs are incredibly important for the growth of the tech ecosystem, but especially the fintech ecosystem. Just the types of businesses you're building here are by nature going to need VC funding to get to scale. They're scale businesses almost always. And so you really need to trust VCs because you're going to need them. You're going to need to rely on them. And I feel like it the same way. I love to work again with people like Anthony that I know are on the founder's side, but also going to bring a ton of stuff to the table that I can't bring for founders. And so that's why I always think about VCs and referring founders to VCs is I know where I can add value. There are a lot of places where a VC is going to add a lot more value than me on particular topics. Having you know a Rolodex of VCs that you trust that you can bring to the table in deals, I think is critical to be a really successful angel investor and ultimately will be better for the founder too. And the other way I think about that for myself is I want to be the safe space for the founder as an operator. And so I want to be the person that a founder can come to if they're dealing with a really big issue or they're struggling with something that they maybe don't want to tell their lead investor. I should be the safe space for that. And the, the VC should be the person you should talk to when you're trying to figure out how do I get to scale? How do I think about this next big fundraising hurdle I have to get over? And then you need both at different times in your life cycle as a founder. Let's go now to core learnings, right? So if you were to look back to your kind of older, younger Keith, who is about to start angel investing, right? What are three core learnings that you've had from angel investing you would tell him? The first one would be founder first and look for grit. I think times where I've made bad investments have been where, oh, I think this market is really interesting or this problem is really interesting, but I have a couple of doubts about the founder. But you know, the problem is so interesting, I'm going to ignore those doubts. Whereas the best investments I've done sometimes have been ones where I just love the founder so much. And even if I think the way they're approaching this particular market doesn't make sense, I actually know they're going to go through so many iterations. They're going to have to pivot a couple of times. And what matters most is, does this founder have the grit to actually push through all the struggles they're going to hit? And that's been a 100% hit rate. Like The high grit founders have been the best investments for me. So that's the number one thing I look for. The number two thing I look for, and I've sort of mentioned this a little bit before, is knowing my strengths and where can I turn my experience into evolutionary advantage for a founder? So where can I help a founder who's going to be going through the exact same experiences that I've gone through to get to my successes faster and avoid the mistakes that I made? So I think of angel investing as that sense you're like paying it forward. And hopefully over time, the founding journey gets better and better and better because you have people behind you who have made mistakes before or who have found the path to success faster. So I think about that as the next thing. So that's the market, again, the, the problem space, the type of technology that they're working on. That's the second place I look for. Does that fit with my strengths? And then the third thing is, can we find a communication line that works? And again, this goes back to, I want to be on the founder's side. I want to be their support mechanism. 
I go very quickly now to how do you like to work with angels? How do you communicate with your team? And do you want to communicate with me in that same way? And I think if I find founders who have a ton of grit, who are focusing somewhere that I know I have experience that can add value, and who are very open with how they want to communicate with me, those are always going to be successful angel relationships. And oftentimes, the most successful investing outcomes as well. 100%. And let me zoom into the first point, if, if that's okay. So what, do you have any views on solo founders, like, you know, backing solo founders versus co-founders? I don't have a hard no to solo founders, but I've found that someone that has at least one co-founder, I think I see higher success rates there in the way they build their business. And part of this is because I think if you're a solo founder, you actually need a really an even stronger angel ecosystem and VC ecosystem around you because you need someone to bounce ideas off of to help you carry the load of building this entire business and carrying the weight of that business forward. I think that's always easier if you have a co-founder you trust or co-founders you trust. So I do think solo founders I dig deeper on and I do more due diligence on than co-founders because I feel like they're going to need more support if they're standing alone than someone that has a co-founder next to them. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think on the one hand, it's kind of proven that like, having a co-founder really helps on the resilience point, right? Like, you know, the one day you're down, you have your co-founder to pick you up, right? On the other hand, like, I think sometimes people, you know, on the other side, side of the spectrum, they tend to brute force a co-founder is never a good thing, right? Especially if you look back, like the number one reason why pre c companies fail is founder fights, right? So it's, a, it's quite a nice conundrum, but I would agree with that. Yeah, and for us, like, I think, one thing that we found was very important, and I think especially in the market that's passed now has proven to has treated us very well, is uh, always ask the why, right? Like, what is the reason? Like, you know, what is that obsession? What is the trigger behind the motivation for the founder for building the company they are building, right? Absolutely. Any preferences for serial founders versus operators? Uh, do you have any views on that? It goes back to the experience point. I think you're always going to be more successful if you are encountering problems that you've seen before. And so in that sense, if you're a serial founder, you know some of the, just some of the operational aspects of scaling a business from having done it before, even if it failed, to take that to the next step. But I also think a lot of operators have gone through that as well. And so I don't have a problem with operators being founders, as long as they're bringing experience to bear. But again, this goes back to grit first. It's like, there are times where I've taken a bet on an operator who's a first time founder and doesn't necessarily have relevant experience, but they have a great why and they have a ton of grit. And then you know they're going to be successful. But I think for serial founders, they're just going to avoid some of the pitfalls much faster that a first time founder is going to run into 90% of the time. Yeah, 100%. And, and you got to love, you know, the operator has seen the problem inside, has everything to prove in the world, right? Like natively. But of course, then it's about their capacity to become founders. And, you know, vice versa, the serial founders going through the trodden path. But what is the chip on the shoulder, right? What makes mm -hmm. them still hungry to prove, you know, all of what they have? So yeah, 100%. I have to ask you, Keith, and I love asking VCs when they say this on, <laughs> on the European VC, which is you say you're founder first. What does that really mean and how do you test for it? Because, you know, it's so mm -hmm. everyone says it, but it's very rare that you get a real, you know, this is what I really look for in them. This is how I test it. This is blah, blah, blah. Could you dive into that a bit? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think two ways I think about that. One is, do I get a sense or do I think I can create a sense of vulnerability? Because I'm an operator angel, right? I'm not a VC angel. And so I want to be a person that they can come to when they have a real serious problem. Like I'm having a fight with my co-founder or, hey, I made this really big hire and it's going terribly and I don't know what to do about it. I want to be the person that they can come talk to about that. And so do I feel that sense of psychological safety with the founder because if I don't feel that, then there's not as much trust there. And I think my value add is going to be lower there. And my sense of trust in that founder is going to be lower as well. So I think that's the number one thing that I test for. And then uh, I also test for what are they asking of me? Do they just want my name on a piece of paper and then to move on? Or do, are they coming to me because they think I have a very specific thing to add? So in that sense, I always leave time at the end of any founder conversation to say, what questions do you have for me? What what can I bring to the table? 
And the founders that really have good answers there, it's just like interviewing a candidate for a role. You get so much out of just being quiet and letting the founder speak and seeing what they're asking, actually trying to pull out of you. That's where you get a great sense of the type of founder and type of founder relationship you're going to have. You know, you're saying find the communication line that works as your third core learning. And I would just maybe ask you if you have seen breakdowns of communication where you thought, ah, we could have solved that, you know, earlier on. Yeah, I think what I've seen, and I'm sure both of you have probably seen this in your investing careers as well, is where a founder says, actually, the way I want to communicate with investors is I'm going to send out a monthly update, and that's going to be my only communication line. And then inevitably, they start to do it every other month or a quarter, and then eventually just dies out, and you sort of have a founder go quiet. That's why, for me, I would much rather be on either a a regular email or WhatsApp communication cadence with a founder than be waiting for some sort of regular update because I feel like it's hard to actually keep that going. And if that update is going out to all of their investors, they're not going to actually want to air out the really big problem they're trying to tackle with because it's going to affect the way investors are viewing their company. And I want to be the person where they can air out the big problem they're trying to deal with. That's always going to be better one-on-one. So it's what is that one-on-one communication line that I like to look out for. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know what we've seen is also, and I know as an angel investor, it might be harder to establish, but there's so much missed opportunity on the connectivity of the different investments you make, right? Like, are there ways in which you can create the conditions for X founder you've backed to be able to connect with Y founder you've backed because they have something in common or an issue in common, or one you can leverage the advice of one that's just been through something recently, right? And you know, communication can be such a powerful tool to tap into those knowledge networks, and that's something we definitely are kind of uh, looking to professionalize a bit more for us, at least. Absolutely. Awesome. So now I will take us to the quick fire round. And that means that I'll ask you some questions and, and challenge you to answer the questions rather quickly. Are you ready, Keith? I'm ready for it. Let's do it. First question is, what is the most counterintuitive thing you've learned since you started Angel Investing? Founder over market for me. That, well, that was very precise. It's very rare that we get to someone being that precise. So thanks a million, Keith. Second question, what would be your top tip to angels wanting to do more international investments? Be present and embedded in that international ecosystem where you want to do investments. Do people in that ecosystem actually know you? Do you know that ecosystem? You literally physically have to be there, spend time, get to know people if you're going to be in the deal flow. I think there's no substitute for that. And final question, what advice would you give your 10-year younger self if you only had 30 seconds? I think take more risks and trust your gut. I think for people that have a certain view of being like a high achiever in their career, it can be easy to see the gold, the yellow brick path. It's a lot more fun to go off the yellow brick path, I think. And so take more risks. I always tell people to take more risks. Thanks a million, Keith. This was an awesome episode. I'm super happy you joined us here. And I cannot wait to really just catch up and get to know you more. Yeah, it it is really people like you that make the tech ecosystem better and whether it's operating or angel investing. So we're lucky to have you. Thanks for coming in. Thank you both for having me. And, you know, Anthony, I know working with people like you makes me a better investor, angel and operator too. So always happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Super Angel Podcast, the go-to podcast for angels backing the next generation of European unicorn founders. If you love our show, do drop us a review, share it with your friends and join our Slack community at the europeanvc.com forward slash community. And if you're an angel listening in and wanting to get closer to the European angel scene, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. We'd love to connect and see how we can play together. Vaban from Carter is the easiest way to launch and run your syndicate. Our end-to-end platform automates your back office so you can focus on the things that matter, supporting the next generation of entrepreneurs and building your network. Angel investors are the fuel to innovation, and we've created the Atom SPV to allow for more deals, more ownership, and less fees. Backed by Carter, the leading fintech infrastructure company, will be with you all from fundraising to exit. Investors on our platform have raised over $2.5 billion in global investments for companies including Revolut, Bolt, and SpaceX. You've been touched by an angel, girl.